all know the game. As a person who was inspired by the likes of James Rolfe, it feels a bit odd having to review this game. But I can't get to the other Castlevania games until I get this review done and over with. So with that said, let's just begin. Is Castlevania 2 Simon's Quest better than its sequel in just about every single way? No. But let's take a deeper look. So I had my fun with the original Castlevania. Yeah, it made me want to pull my hair out, but not on the same level as games such as Super Ghouls and Ghosts and Contra 3. After beating the game, I immediately tried my hand at the second game. If you leave the title running, the game welcomes you to the Hell House, although by looking at the opening scene, I'm pretty sure I'm outside. Seriously, what's with this Hell House? Simon Belmont is once again the star of the game. After whipping the shit out of Dracula in the last game, the Count placed a curse on Simon upon death. So why is the third game subtitle called Dracula's Curse instead of being the subtitle for this game? In order to rid himself of the curse, Simon needs to collect pieces of Dracula that have been placed in five different mansions by god knows who. Upon starting the game, one of the biggest changes to the gameplay becomes immediately apparent. Instead of a strictly left to right linear progression, Castlevania 2 Simon's Quest introduces fans to an incredibly non-linear design that allows players to take Simon where they want him to go. There's no stages, no time limit, and no enemy health bar. It's all one giant world and you're gonna need to explore it all in order to complete your adventure. Technically, Vampire Killer on the MSX did it first, but for most of us, it was the first time they did something like this. Like the first game, Simon still struts like nobody's business, has an uncontrollable jump, moves like a tank on stairs, and once again suffers from knockback issues. Ugh, that's gonna happen a lot, especially in this game. Simon still attacks enemies with his trusty whip, which can now be upgraded up to four times by purchasing different whips in towns that Simon can visit, assuming you have the hearts to buy them. Yeah, the hearts aren't just ammunition this time, they're now also money. What kind of fucked up country uses ammunition as currency, let alone hearts? So am I to believe that Kano is not only killing his victims, but also stealing their wallet? Well, moving on, sub-weapons also return, but instead of finding them through candles, you can either just buy them from a merchant, or complete an incredibly obscure task and collect it as a reward. Want the silver dagger? Just drop some garlic in the graveyard, and this random man will appear out of thin air and give it to you. Simple, right? The only sub-weapons that don't make a return are the axe and stopwatch. The axe I can live without, but I sure would've liked the stopwatch. Well, at least Simon's Quest introduces us to the diamond sub-weapon, which... Hmm. Yeah, I'm already missing the stopwatch. You can also buy some Laurels, which grants you temporary invincibility. Ah, good old invincibility in a can. Dracula's pieces also count as equipment for Simon. For instance, equipping Dracula's rib lets Simon use a shield to deflect projectiles, and Dracula's heart allows you to reach the third mansion by showing it to the incredibly creepy fairy man. Oddly enough, the only sub-weapon that doesn't cost hearts to use is the holy water. Hmm, I wonder why. The towns that Simon can explore are about as basic as you can get. You can either buy upgrades from Crooked Traders, go to a neon church and recover health for no charge, or waste time talking to one of the townspeople. The reason why I say you're wasting time is because for a majority of the game, the townspeople have nothing useful to say. The first guy you meet gives you a nice hint, but as far as memory goes, that's about it. Most of the time, people just tell you the vague whereabouts of clues to Dracula's riddle, and other times they just spur completely useless trivia. Well, hello there, crouching lady, you have any good deals? Well, geez, that's the last time I ever barged into someone's house. The nerve. When you aren't exploring a town, you're beating the hell out of enemies in all sorts of blocky regions, each sporting their own vibrant colors. Actually, the enemy selection is rather dull this time around. While I'm glad none of the enemies are as annoying as, say, the hunchbacks or the axe knights, not counting the fucking blobs, you're gonna get tired of seeing the same skeleton sprite over and over again with a different touch of color. Now, each region does come equipped with their own selection of bad guys, mummies, medusa heads, xenomorphs, but most of the time, it's skeletons. Ah, uh, one of the main gimmicks of the game, the day and night system. You see, when you travel long enough, a text box will interrupt whatever you're doing and let you know the time of the day is about to change. During the day, you can visit towns and kill enemies with ease. During the night, the towns are closed and the enemies take more hits to kill, and Simon becomes a warhog. I mean, never mind. I don't really mind the whole transition phase between night and day. Hey, anything that lets me take a sip of my drink while playing is okay with me. One of the things I hate the most is the actual process of waiting for the time of the day to change. Let me break it down. You see, like I mentioned earlier, you can only buy items with hearts during the day. You collect hearts by destroying enemies. During the night, enemies are harder to kill, but they drop more hearts to compensate. If you ever plan on getting somewhere in the game, you're gonna need a lot of hearts, because items, especially the whip upgrades, are expensive. The best way to get hearts without straying too far from a town is grinding the hell out of these zombies, and by god, you cannot get any more monotonous than this. It takes forever, and even when you get enough hearts, you still have to wait for daylight to arrive.
I'm not a really big fan of Rolling Rock. Finally! And God forbid you die during the grind, because if you get a game over, you lose all of your hearts. You see, you have a total of three lives. I don't think there's a way to get more, but anyway. When you die, you begin immediately where you left off, even when you get a game over. So, what's the point of lives? It's like the only point of a game over is to take all of your hearts. Assholes. When you aren't grinding enemies for hearts, you're probably spending most of your time wondering just where the hell you need to go in order to continue the game. With information from townsfolk that ranges from cryptic to just all-around useless, Castlevania 2 is a game where you are pretty much required to read a guide in order to proceed. Whether it's the hints given to you through Nintendo Power or the technological cesspool that is the internet, reading a guide is the only way you'll find out that you need to equip the red crystal, crouch at this dead end, and wait for a whirlwind to warp you to the other side. Or equipping the blue crystal, crouching to this body of water, only to find out that it's not really a body of what? Wait, what the hell am I looking at? I can't imagine how first timers were supposed to figure this shit out. It's worse than the original Metroid. Not as bad as Shadowgate, though. Ugh, that game makes me cringe. In order to collect the piece of Dracula, you need to travel inside one of the five mansions and make your way through more skeletons, spear guards, the occasional gargoyle, and these incredibly annoying blobs. By God, I didn't think it can get any worse than Hunchbacks, but combined with the problem I had with stairs in an old school Castlevania game, it's just simply impossible to avoid getting hit. Each mansion is packed to the brim with obstacles, including invisible walls, breakable blocks, and most annoyingly, invisible pitfalls. Seriously, it's bad enough the game forces you many times to make an extremely picky jump, but just to fuck with you thinking you can stand on something that's not really there is just fucking mean. This is why I think the Holy War doesn't cost any hearts to use. The developers knew you were going to spam the hell out of it just to see where an invisible pitfall is located. Along your journey inside a mansion, you'll come across a cloaked man that can sell you an oak stake. At first, you probably think it's a one-use sub-weapon that does jack all, but in actuality, it's an item you need to use in front of this orb you come across at the end of each mansion. By doing so, you can possess a piece of Dracula. It's never explained why exactly you need an oak stake. I mean, can I just whip the fucking thing and possess a piece that way? Well, at least the music is pretty damn good. Castlevania 2 introduces us to Bloody Tears, which has become a staple in the series. But other tracks, such as the mansion theme and the town theme, are pretty good too. Only problem is, the entire soundtrack is incredibly limited. It's only about six songs, not including the game over theme and password music. Because of that, you will get sick of the music. It's only a matter of time. Okay, where's the fucking boss fights? I've done about three mansions up to this point, and not one boss fight. Oh god, the Grim Reaper! Eat Devo, motherfucker! Wow, that was pathetic. Such a downgrade from the last game. Okay, so I got the next piece of Dracula in my possession. Let's move on. Whoa, he responds? What the hell? Wait, I could just strut past him? Both ways? Let me see. Oh my god, I could have just skipped him? Granted, he wasn't a challenge to begin with, but... Wow. Oh, well, Carmilla certainly looks more challenging. That's all she does, isn't it? Dear lord, why the sudden castration in the boss department? More importantly, why do only the last two mansions have boss fights to begin with? They were the most memorable part of the last game, for better or worse, but still. Well, after you collect the fifth and final piece of Dracula, it's time to head back to Castlevania, which thanks to your intrusion from the last game is dark, desolate, and have absolutely no obstacles. Kinda boring to be honest, but at the same time it also invokes a sense of paranoia. Finally, after reaching the last room, the pieces of Dracula form a mind of their own and recombine to form Dracula himself. And he's disgustingly easy. Yeah, he's big, and when he manages to hurt you, it really hurts, but let's see. The moment Dracula appears, you can score about 10 hits before he even begins to move. After that, you just gotta whip him about 3 more times and BAM, he's toast. You can also use the nerve strategy and just spam the hell out of Mystic Fires, or my personal favorite, use a Laurel, stand in the center, and SPAM THE HELL OUT OF THE ATTACK BUTTON! Whoopa! At last, we've completed Simon's quest. Although the confrontation between Simon and Dracula has concluded, Simon couldn't survive his fatal wounds at- Wait, wait, what? Simon dies anyway? Actually, depending on how fast you complete the game, you can get one of three endings, with this one considered to be the normal ending. Damn, I couldn't imagine what the bad ending would look like. The battle has consummated. Now peace and serenity have been restored to Transylvania, and the people are free of Dracula's curse forever. And you, Simon Belmont, will always be remembered for your bravery and courage. Oh well, wait, the bad ending is better than a normal ending. What the shit? The best ending requires you to beat the game in less than 8 game days, but honestly, you're better off just using the game's password feature to get it. By the way, the Famicom version of Simon's Quest is a save feature, yet the NES version does not. 
may I ask why? Zelda had a save feature, Final Fantasy had a save feature, I think it would have definitely helped. Out of all the classic Castlevanias, this is certainly my least favorite. The non-linear style, while an interesting choice, is executed rather poorly here, and because of that, you'll spend most of your time lost with no idea how to proceed. I blame the poorly written dialogue, but it's not just the non-linear style that's the problem. The process of getting hards and buying upgrades can be incredibly tiresome. After a while, you begin to grow sick of fighting the same kinds of enemies over and over again. The controls, once again, are still an issue. Not so much as last time because of the open-ended level design of this game, but it's incredibly apparent when there's water pits involved. Seriously, the jumps they expect you to do are ridiculous. Ah, The music's good, but even that can't save the game from all the other problems it suffers from. It's not terrible, it's just an experiment gone awry. Even with a password system, Simon's Quest is a game that requires too much energy and patience to enjoy in one sitting. With that said, I'll give the game a 5.5 out of 10. Only hardcore fans of the Castlevania series will find any sort of enjoyment from it. Personally, there are much better Castlevania games out there. Okay, I can easily say the worst is over, and I apologize to all those that really do like Castlevania 2 Simon's Quest, but to me it's too much of a chore to play. Luckily, I think it only gets better from here, so next time we meet for Monthly Castlevania, we're looking at Castlevania 3 Dracula's Cur- Castlevania 3 Dracula's Curse for the NES. Until then, see you next time.